going to mug me? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Download Veely now. Hi, I'm in Denver, Colorado. This isn't the train I'm taking you on, it's another train, a legendary train, the California Zephyr. For me, this is a dream because this train symbolizes the conquest of the West and the discovery of another America. From the Rocky Mountains to mythical California, go west to San Francisco. Finally, I'm going to take this legendary train through a mythical country, the American Far West. A railroad that single-handed could tell the history of America. Tracks and men is a promising start. Like many stars, the California Zephyr has a reputation for keeping its public waiting. While waiting, I discover an original station, a huge brick building that has just been renovated and where travelers like to take their time. That's how I ran into Tom Noel, great Colorado historian and professor at the University of Denver. So this is a fantastic place here, the old train station, which is also an hotel and some bar restaurant here. And the track, actually the railway uh, is a part of uh, the Colorado history, but I mean also of all American history, it was the conquest of the West. Right, it was the railroads that really made mining pay off, which is how Denver gets started as a mining camp and then uh, the railroads come in in 1870 and Denver booms with the railroads. Yes. And uh, you're in an inland uh, western city. The there's no river port here, there's no seaport, so the station, Union Station, is the heart of the town. Mm -hmm. You have the discovery of gold, 1858, the birth of Denver that year, when it becomes the second largest city in the West, yeah. a second only to San Francisco, bigger than Los Angeles, yeah. bigger than any city in Texas. Yeah. So, Obama was a traveler on the train, like Jack London, no? Right, like Jack London. Jack London and, was of the Obama. Yeah, and Jack Kerouac. Jack Kerouac, too. He was yeah. traveling on the train. Yeah. I will try to be a, a hobo today. Yeah. <laughs> Why is so famous? Why is so legendary this train? Legendary? Well, it's the last one left. There used yeah. to be a lot more passenger trains, and that California Zephyr had that sleek stainless steel exterior to it. It was Art Deco design at a time when Art Deco was yeah. new in the States. Yeah. So it inspired a lot of even the way automobiles look like. They wanted yeah. to look like the Zephyr. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. I want to go to Fraser Park. Oh, Fraser. Uh, Winter, Winter Park, Fraser, it's here? Uh, yes. yes what, what, at what time, so? Because it was supposed to be 8 o'clock. Right, so right now, we, we are late. For which reason? It's what can happen is the rock can come down the mountain and can hit across the track. Yeah. We got to wait for them to clean it up. So we stop, stop Union Pacific, clean it up, and we wait. That's all we can do. Okay. So it's exciting. It's an adventure. It's an adventure, <laughs> and you have to be patient. Straight to. Rocky Mountains, huh? Yeah, Rocky Mountains, that it is. See you okay. later. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. A legend on bogies. Dubbed Silver Lady, the Zephyr eats up close to 4,000 kilometers from Chicago to the Pacific Ocean. From Denver to San Francisco, I'll cross four states. An epic journey at less than $200 for 33 hours travel. With a bonus, a ticket inspector with a sense of humor who tells me about his line and its unchanging scenery. 
We are now entering the Moffat Tunnel. This is the great tunnel that makes the California Zephyr possible through the Rockies, not around them. It's 6.2 miles long. You will be as deep into the earth as most of you will ever go. Unless, of course, you go on the Goddard Base Tunnel through Switzerland to Italy, in which case you get a little bit deeper and you'll go a little bit further. But who wants to go there? Thank you. In the Vista Dome, there's a friendly atmosphere. Rather like America is coming to you. Hello. Can I sit here? Sure. Hello. Be glad for you too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Olivier. Ken. OK, nice That's to meet you. Here. And so you are traveling by train only uh, in America? I started in uh, DC, Washington. Oh, DC. East Coast, though. Huh? Yeah, I went from East Coast to West Coast wow. on a train. How long is it to travel to cross USA? Uh, it's or? taken me about Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. I'm not going straight through. Right. I'm stopping along stopping, the way. Stopping, sleeping in the towns yeah, and coming I, back. Uh, and... So this is the first time in the Rocky Mountains. Yes, sir. Yeah. Like me. Yes, sir. That's, That's what's fantastic about the taking the train. You meet people like Can, and you can take your time, chat. Often travelers who don't really know their country like the slow pace. And as Can says, open your eyes and your heart. It's fantastic. That's great. Thank you, Can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raj. Enjoy Have a good trip. trip. Huh? Yes, sir, you too. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Brad, the conductor. We're coming up on a place called Rollinsville now, along South Boulder Creek that we've been following ever since we went through tunnel number eight. Also is where the peak to peak highway goes. So if you're ever cursed to have to go through Colorado on rubber tires on roads, take the peak to peak highway. It's one of the most scenic byways in the country and at least half as interesting as our train ride. So if you're not where you want to be now when we go in the tunnel, go to where you want to be soon so that when we get to the tunnel, you're where you want to be. Thank you. And now we're passing another freight train. OK. And that one is out of our way. OK, hello, I'm Olivier. You know hello. everything about the train on the Rocky Mountains, no? I know a little bit. Yeah, OK. I've done it. 20 some years, so I have 20 some, some years. Okay, yeah. okay. From from where? From Denver to San Denver Francisco? to Grand Junction. Oh, Only Grand, Grand Junction. Junction. Okay, just, okay. just the Colorado Rockies. This is your your part. Oh, yes, okay. This, this is my part. I started my career in Seattle, which Seattle. was also stunningly beautiful. Mm -hmm. But this is home, yeah. and this is where I wanted to be. Okay. Yeah. The beautiful thing about the train is that not only do you go from the cities, but you also go through the geology. You go through yeah. the uh, the wildlife, you go through the forests, you, yeah. you can really get into all of the best things. Sure. About and this is also the part of the history of America here. For example, of course, the conquest of the West and also the uh, material like the mine, mining industry and silver, I think yes. copper, gold, everything in Colorado. No? If yeah. we didn't have the railroads, it never would have been able to open up. Right. Beginning in the 1880s, mm -hmm. but the line we're on now was actually built in 1900. Right. by a guy who made his money from those mines. Right. So his yeah. name was David Moffat. He wanted to have a railroad through the Rockies, mm -hmm. not around them. Yeah. And so he punched it through. Yeah. And it's become what I consider to be the most spectacular train ride yeah. in America, for sure, yeah. and one of the best in the world. The world, OK. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's see. Not the Schwarzwelder on the Tunnel Channel going in. Excuse me. This is really moving for me. I remember a book I read long ago by Jack London, The Road. He tells of when he was 20 and was a hobo or railroad stowaway, not on the train, but under the train, on the bogies, because it was an offence punishable by prison. So Jack London and his hobo friends would take this type of train. The vastness of the American West does remind you of the founding myths. The atypical travelers in this nomadic caravanserai who love the slowness are here and dreaming once more of adventures, even in winter. Beautiful landscapes, huh? One of my dreams. Check it off the bucket list for okay. sure. Absolutely. And you, you don't like the plane, to take the plane? <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Why? Definitely not. You know, I can't really travel by plane. I think the first time I, I tried to travel by plane, you know the entrance tunnel to the plane? Yes. I, uh, I actually fainted. Ooh. Yeah. So since then, 
Yeah. I've been a driver and a train guy. But the problem is, is I enjoy the beautiful views, but um, I'm a I'm a big backpacker and, and rock climber. Yeah. So rock climber. Yeah, rock climber. Um, so whenever I see a, a beautiful you can, you can like climb view, here. exactly, I want to get. Yeah, I oh, want I want the train to stop so I can get off and climb or hike really you quick. You one today, no? I've seen several. I've so, seen amazing, amazing climbing spots. Yeah. yeah. What is your job? So what are you doing? Uh, so I am a. Uh, it's called a QB chef uh, at a QB restaurant. QB chef. Uh, a QB chef. So yeah. you like uh, cooking with organic, and you like oh, yeah. mountains. It means oh, yeah. you, you love the nature. Huh? Oh, I love it. So yeah. I will jump here. It's interesting oh, to see this place. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, I'm not used to this this mountainous okay. region. I'm live. I'm I'm from Michigan. It's it's just sure. flat. Very oh. wild. But this is also a skiing station, huh? Oh, I love skiing. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate it to meet you, Casey. Good luck for your hey, absolutely. You as well. cuisine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, my See friend. See you next time. Absolutely. See you in San Francisco, maybe. Hey, maybe, maybe. Absolutely. Bye. I'll buy you a beer. Hey. Okay, bye. bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, Thanks. Bye, bye. In the hollow of the Rockies in Fraser at 3,000 meters altitude, there hides a resort famed for its outstanding skiers. They're preparing for the Olympics, or rather the Paralympic Games, like Stephen Haller, 28, who despite his disability, has been sliding on snow since he was six years old. Training today. It's awesome. Perfect conditions. Yes. Snow's great. Sun's out. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so you have good coach and a good materials too. Uh, how, can you explain to me, or does it work? Um, yeah. So we have a shock in here. Yeah. It clicks into the ski normal. Yeah. And then we put a block back here, mm -hmm. so it doesn't release. We don't okay. want it to come off. Uh, din is set at 30, so very high. Very high. Very high. Is and better for you? Yeah. We don't want to come out. You don't want to come out. <laughs> And these are outriggers okay. uh, that you push like this, and then you flip down to go ski. Yeah. What is the difference of technique for you between the slalom and Super G? Uh, just turning quicker. In Super G, you have to be a lot more subtle. Yeah. You turn slower. You're going faster, but everything happens slower. It means you have to be in good uh, condition for training, but also in the mind. Yeah. If this is the case, I mean, you're, you train also yourself to be ready. Yeah, we work with sports psychologists on the team because doing a downhill is kind of scary sometimes. Yeah. You get going pretty fast, yes. over 100K, so. Wow, 100 kilometers an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so. so tomorrow it will be the case with the training. Uh, maybe. maybe, close to maybe, it. Yeah. Maybe. So, and the coach is coming. <laughs> See you. You are better skiers than me, huh? <laughs> All I have to do now is wait. I'm in Fraser in the heart of Colorado and the Rocky Mountains. Yesterday the train was three hours late. Today? Who knows? We'll see. A mythical train called Zephyr that should be called Godo. It keeps you waiting so long. But this isn't the right train. In the land of hyperspeed, waiting, acquiring a taste for slowness is no bad thing. And I'm told it's the beginning of wisdom. In the days of the gold rush, many pioneers were left on the platform. Well, it's slightly late, around two hours, but that seems normal here. On we go.
This is where we realize that the United States really is a very big country. You could almost call it a continent. This is just Colorado. And look, in just four hours' time, I'll only have crossed a tiny part of the state, passing, of course, through the Rockies, which are here, under the snow. I'm Tommy, very nice to meet you. It's nice to travel by train. You are going to where? It's very nice to travel by train, and I'm going to Glenwood Springs, yeah. where I attend to a conference on biodynamics in okay. agriculture yeah. topic. Sure. Four days conference. So You have a French accent. You're... I'm totally French. Oh, okay. Why not uh, we'll uh, speak uh, French then. Perfect. You work here? I work more in California, not really in Colorado, as an enologist, so I make wines. I'm a consultant in biodynamics. That's great. Uh, organic wine, then. Absolutely. It's an alternative agricultural method developed in the early 20th century that uses minerals and plants instead of chemicals. Does that concern the whole country? Will people at the conference be Americans from all over? Absolutely. There are Americans, it could be on the East Coast or the West Coast or Colorado, come to share their knowledge. We'll be talking about associating biodynamics with permaculture. It's very, very interesting to possibly link these two practices for more efficiency and simplicity. It's very exciting. Very good. Well, I'll carry on my way. I get off at the next station. Fine. All the best. Have a good biodynamics conference. Thanks, Olivier. Hope to see you soon. Bon voyage. Thanks. In Glenwood Springs, I have an appointment with a pioneer worthy of the conquest of the West. Instead of discovering silver mines, engineer Steve Beckley found hot water right next to the railroad, with springs that are worth a fortune. Hello, Steve. Hello, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, this is your spa, your, how do you say, your hot springs? Yes, this is our hot springs, our natural hot springs. All this water comes from the earth, yes. so it comes up deep from the earth, 15,000, 5,000 meters deep. Right. Comes up to the surface, comes up hot. And why is so famous this hot spring here? Because of the for the minerals. Maybe minerals, it's good for the yeah, health. It's good for, you know, it, your skin absorbs these minerals. So Which whatever part of these, minerals? Yeah. You know, calcium and and sulfates and sulfurs and uh, carbonates and all sorts of other lithium and magnesium and iron. Wow. And they can all be absorbed in the skin. So people soak and absorb these minerals in their skin, and and it's very yeah. healing. Good. And people just love to come. Right. Relax, take in the, the mountains okay. and, and the river. Colorado River too. Yes, just okay. like very, you know, you know, mentally healing, you know, yeah. so. You How did you get the idea actually to build this spa? This, well, you know, uh, uh, I had the caverns property across the road and, yes. and I looked at this property, it was empty. And I, so I, and I saw the hot water coming out of the ground. I said, okay. it's, let's, let's buy this property and build these pools and see if people come. And, yeah. You want to bring me? I want, I want to see your cave. So yes, it's I believe. up in the mountains? Yes, or? it's, it's about, uh, 400 meters higher. This is the entrance of your cave? This is this is the back lot. This is the maintenance area. So this is your secret garden, I guess. Yes, right. Wow. Big cave, amazing. <laughs> yes, very beautiful cave. Yeah. So it yeah. seems to be very hard, no? Yes, it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, good temperature, 52 degrees year round. Yes. 98% uh, humidity. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting is this room was where the hot springs, the same one we saw down below, the hot yes. springs came up in this room three million years ago and it formed all this. And forming the ores. Yes, and well. all the holes took, ate away the limestone and left these caves. Oh, it has been discovered by people just. Uh, just exploring, you know, moving exploring, rocks yeah. and 
crawling through holes and finding bigger rooms. And yes. uh, you know, when we bought the cave uh, 20 years ago, there was only a mile of known cave, and now we're at four miles. So, four miles. Okay. Yes. So, so you discover yourself yes. some, some, some lots, caves. Lots of caves. How was it possible? You just have to you know, dig, or? dig and move rock, and then open up into big rooms like this. It's not, not dangerous, no. No. You it seems to be a very passion, a little passion for you too, for caving. Oh, Where does absolutely. it come from? Can you imagine being the first person squeezing through a hole and finding a room like this? And your light is the first light that's ever been yeah. in here. And this is one of the few places in the world that you can still find something that no one else has ever been to. Yeah. So this is this is my passion, is finding you know beautiful yeah. rooms like this. It means also taking care of the cave, taking care of the mother nature, because this Absolutely. is a specific ecosystem, isn't yes, it? Yes, this is an ecosystem that uh, is only found here. We have 54 unique species. This is the only place in the world they're found. You notice when we came in, we have airtight doors that protect the humidity. This cave is very humid, 98%. We need to make sure we keep the cave pristine so those species can live in here and uh, survive. In the middle of the western village runs a river. Still shy in its upper reaches, the Colorado is a river famous for its fish and its sometimes miraculous fishing. Morning. Morning. How are you Ryan. doing? <laughs> yes. I'm fine, thank you. Nice to meet you. Huh? Nice to meet you too. You are the famous fishing guide here in Colorado River, so I want to fish with you if it's possible. Yeah. I want to learn actually. Huh? Yeah. We're going to fish for trout. We're going to see, hopefully we'll see rainbows and browns, maybe mm -hmm. some cutthroat, mm -hmm. cut bows. So your specialty, you, Ryan, is to fish with the flyer. Yep. Can you show me or does it work? Yeah, there's lots of different techniques. One of the most famous techniques and the one that people like to do the most is fishing on top. Mm -hmm. See the fish come up and take the fly. Oh, yeah. And there's nothing better than that. It seems very real, huh? Yeah. So this is for the different, uh, yes, ants and uh, bees and... The other techniques we use are streamers. Mm -hmm. These are all underwater, representing a sculpin or a small fish. Mm. And they're stripping along underwater and fish will attack It works. Them. It, it works, works great. Actually. You need a lot of imagination actually to create all the hooks, huh? Yeah. <laughs> now we have all the flies. Yep. So maybe we can go, I follow you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Let's be ready. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah, it's fantastic. So this is a mythical river, Colorado River. It's very important for you two Americans, I mean, this river. It feeds the West. Yeah. <laughs> so we are going to fish on this way down? We're going to cruise down and then we're going to pull over and fish. Yeah. What about the rapids? It's strong today, huh? Yeah, they're okay. not too bad. You More rocks too. than rapids today. Yeah. On this river, they practice catch and release in order to protect stocks. The inhabitants of Colorado, like Ryan, are above all committed to preserving their environment. There he was. Too slow. Your rod needs to look like this. Your hand is pointing to the sky. Your rod tip's pointing down towards the water. The fish is going to be running a little bit. If he runs really hard, let some line out. Oh, yeah, it's a good movement, huh? <laughs> right. Wow, Bro, congrats. Thanks. A little brown trout. Wow. Beauty. Yeah. One pound? Oh, maybe not even. <laughs> ready? And be ready when that thing sinks to raise your arm. Now you see you're pulling that bobber. Okay. So just recast back. Like this? Yep. And then? Cast it on out. Like this? Yep, if it does anything. Right there, set the hook, set the hook. Fish on. We'll try and catch one. Ryan says there are lots. You sometimes feel them on the hook, but they're not very keen on being fished today. You can be fishing the Colorado and meters away see the Union Pacific train. This is the train that repairs the rails, much in demand by good trains, especially for rocks that can fall down from the cliffs. Oi, 
right there, set, 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 set. Pick up your rod, pick up your rod. Bring him right over here. Awesome. Good. <laughs> My turn to release the fish. The Rockies stretch across several states through which the Zephyr passes, a theater of dreams cleft by a chrome locomotive and its six wagons. These great wild spaces recall the books of Fenimore Cooper and Jim Harrison, rocky pyramids that defy the centuries. At Grand Junction, the scenery evokes the conquest of the West. In the land of cowboys, I wonder if there's such a thing as cowgirls. In Colorado, cattle breeding is a big earner for milk and for meat, but also for the show. And farmers' daughters are often excellent horsewomen. You are preparing the competitions? Or? Yes, preparing the horses, what? getting them saddled up. Yeah, you will rope today? Mm, I will rope a cow. Yeah, and you are doing uh, that for how many years? Um, let's see, about eight years now. But it means for you, a uh, champion, it's very natural to ride horses because you are like born on horses, no? Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, I was born and raised riding horses. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually in my mom's tummy when she was riding horses and jumping and competing, so it's very natural to me. I brought my horses here from my hometown, and, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of facilities like this. So this is a very nice facility that we can ride in, and we have a facility for our rodeo. Yes. So how do you train uh, for the competition? So, basically, you just have to keep them in shape, you know, trot them around, make mm -hmm. them run. Um, you have to rope a lot. Okay, it's not risky sometimes, is it? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, because they're crazy. Look at them. They could, they could, they kind of have a mind of their own, and they can do whatever they want, but they don't. Oh, yeah. Maybe because they are feeling the competition. Mm -hmm. They love it. They it's... love to compete. So, Carly, good luck. Huh? I know you are preparing competition mm -hmm. today. So, okay, good, uh, good riding. Thank you. Most of the time we expect to see cowboys, and mm -hmm. today you have mm -hmm. girls. Yep. It's normal. It's yep. for you. It's natural. Yep. No. Rodeo, of course, is is we have roles for for men and women in rodeo. We do have both both genders in the sport, so that's nothing uncommon for us. For you know, it has been for for decades and decades. But yeah, I just can't brag on them enough. They're, yeah, they're, they're amazing to have around. They're great horse women. Uh, not to mention the fact that all of these right now are of course taking full class loads and and studying majors in university. So they have a good coach also. I hope. I hope. <laughs> I really. I, I tell you what. I'm I'm really spoiled here because I, I don't have to coach them much. You know, mm -hmm. the only thing that I. I always have told them that I do is that I'll sit with them, we'll watch film if we want to, and we can break it down. It means also, obviously, the spirit of America. We are in the Rocky Mountains. It's also typical of the of the Midwest. Uh, you, you, Americans still love the horses and yes. riding and rodeos. Yes, there is a romance to that Western American way of life that, that has always existed and always been will. I mean, we, we wake up in the morning and we eat, sleep, breathe, horses, cattle, you know, the entire... Um, generations have been raised up around around the ranching lifestyle, around the Wild West, and around the ideas of, of making a home and making a life where other people haven't yet. Intrepid riders, Carly and her friends make me want to taste the equestrian pleasures of the good old days in these unique landscapes. Hello, Russ. Hello. Nice to meet you. You too. <laughs> Welcome. I am in your ranch and uh, in the middle of uh, Colorado. Yes. And you are, I know you are passionate by so horses. You are 
actually more canyon riders who are here. Yes, that's probably the best way to explain me. Probably more canyon rider than rancher, but... Yes. And so I'm sure it's uh, wonderful to visit the place with your horses, no? Yeah, you want to ride? Yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> we got some good ponies for you today. Good. So these are your friends. These are my friends. That's a good way to put it. They they all have their personality, and yeah. every once in a while I find one I don't. You like, know each of them, huh? Each I do each of them. I could tell you, I could tell you quirky things about every one of these yes. horses. Okay. So, I think now the question is deciding which one you're gonna ride. I don't know. So. I don't know your friends. <laughs> <laughs> I do know this. This horse here is one of our better horses. We, I mean, they're all good horses, mm -hmm. but he's uh, real easy going. He just kind of puts his head down and does his job. Mm -hmm. His friend, the white horse is not easy going, right. unless he's with the black and white horse. Okay. So if we choose to have you ride the black and white horse, <laughs> okay. we gotta figure out what to do with the, the white horse. I'll take the black, you'll, you'll take the white Yeah, well maybe. <laughs> yeah, why don't we, why don't we try you on okay. uh, Teepee. Yeah, Teepee. Teepee. My Teepee. name is Teepee. Hello he's, Teepee. Yeah, that's Teepee. I'll show you Is something. he going too? He's, he's easy going, he'll be good. I wanna show you something on Teepee real quick. Sure. You can see right here, see that little triangle? Yes. That's a TP brand. Oh, this is TP. You That's can why. recognize him. Yes, That's okay. Good. And then you can just hold right there, just below the knot. Yes. You only need one hand, so you can rope cows with your other hand. Okay, very good. no problem. <laughs> and you then use the ropes. <laughs> yeah. And then of course the stop. Okay. That's really all you got to know. Okay. Okay, so turn him this way. Give him a little nudge with your legs. Sure. Yeah, there you go. You think you're at a midpoint in the journey across America, right at its heart. As Jack Kerouac wrote on the road to Denver, I was halfway across America at the dividing line between the east of my youth and the west of my future. So uh, tell me about your, your, your passion. Where does it come from? From your childhood? Yeah, you know, I grew up uh, with horses. My dad was really passionate about horses. And that's really where it started, was with my dad. He, he always wanted a horse. In fact, he, he wanted a horse so bad that he took a bum lamb and, and as it got bigger, he sat on it and taught it how to be ridden. <laughs> and so he rode, it, he rode it all over uh, and that was his horse until he graduated high school. <clears throat> you know, with horses, you, you either love them or you don't. There's very few people that ride the middle. There's not so many people living in the area. Actually, Colorado is deserted. <laughs> Well, it's, it's like most mountainous states where the population is condensed in certain areas. Yes. So, mm -hmm. you know, we enjoy being here and not in the population centers. Yeah. I get back on my horse, the iron horse this time, as the Indians called it when the line was built in the mid 19th century, a short night run. Many passengers prefer to sleep in their seat, as at $100 a night, the Zephyr's sleeping berths aren't within the range of every purse. We're arriving in Salt Lake City. I'm just up, having spent a few hours dozing in my seat on the train, which is, in fact, eight hours late. A nice coffee will be a good start, especially as it seems that surprises await me in Salt Lake City. Hello. Hello. You think the next train will be late or so tonight, or you don't know? Uh, right now, it looks like it's running on time. Oh, yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> they, we've had a, a few days here in a row where they've had some oh, hard yeah. time. What's happening with the rocks or uh, the well, landslide? Earlier today, they had a few trains with some rock slides. So, okay. Yeah. And to see the center, what is it? Temple Square, the famous one. It's down. Yeah, it's about uh, four blocks over. Oh, four blocks only. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. The organ music grabs hold of you in the street, 
The Mormons have reigned over Salt Lake City and the whole of Utah since the 19th century, and they love music and showtime. legendary organ, built in 1867, is rather like the story of this whole religious community, very austere. It boasts more than 15 million followers worldwide. Sounds great. Fix it all the way through. All right, take a look at it. We're gonna do it again. At the controls of this incredible instrument is an outstanding musician, Richard Elliott, whose reputation has long transcended borders. Hello, Richard. Hello. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. You are a great organist and uh, with a very beautiful instrument. How many pipes do you have here? Uh, 11,623. Quite a yeah. few pipes. How did you come to music and to play organ? I, I began on the piano as a child and heard the organ in my church and liked the sound. And so when I was about 15 years old, I asked if I could play it and they let me play it. And a few weeks later, they gave me a job and I've been playing it ever since. Uh, yeah. and, uh, went, went and got a doctorate even in organ. Yeah. Okay, and you have so many tools and claviers and uh, instruments too. You have trumpet, hautbois. It's enough for you? Looks, yes, yes, everything here, even a little, uh, little harp sound. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a, like a full orchestra at your fingertips. Right. Okay. It's, it's interesting to realize that the railroad was not here, the trains did not come through. People who came through came on wagons, and when they saw this organ, they were so surprised it was the desert here. There was nothing else here, but mm -hmm. here was this... Uh, glorious uh, organ in the middle of nowhere. Right. At the gate of the City of Mormons lies the famous Great Salt Lake. Against this antediluvian backdrop, some even think they're Jesus walking on water. My railroad journey brings me to Elko, Nevada, a paradise for cowboy boots and saddles, some transformed into works of art. A local craftsman is known throughout the world for his very elaborate saddles, made to measure, if you please. Hi. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. John is here? Yes, he's up in the shop. Okay. Good Hello. afternoon, John. I'm Olivier. Nice to meet John, you. Nice to meet you. Here it's an old tradition in Elko to build saddles for cowboys, but also for for years, no? Oh yeah. So we we build saddles for working cowboys mm -hmm. as well as foreigners. We yeah. we send saddles to Germany, yeah. to Italy, Australia, uh, you know, all over the world. If yeah. if somebody wants one, we can build yeah. it for them. If I discovering the saddle, I can see it's more than work. It's art also. Yes, it's definitely uh, an art. There's not one of these that are ever built the exact same. So everything that we do, uh, we do stuff for stock so mm -hmm. that you would see out here that you could purchase when you come in. Mm -hmm. But those are samples so we can always build something uh, to whatever specs a person ever gives us. If they do a drawing of what they want mm -hmm. or if they have uh, pictures or anything else, they say, I want this, then we can do it. Right. Okay, this is the beginning of the saddle, no? Uh, well, this would be the beginning of a saddle. Ah, yes, okay, with a shape, huh? This is called the tree. Okay. So there is wood in this, and it's 
softwood, pines and fir mm -hmm. uh, that go into this and then this is covered with raw hide. Mm -hmm. So the, the untanned hide of a cow is okay. what is covered with this. And so after you are assembled? These are the, some uh, different like repairs, uh, yeah. Yes. How much does it cost a good saddle? Uh, base price is $4,300 for a plain one, mm -hmm. and then it goes up to around $8,000. $8,000. So it means for you it's a real passion, actually. It's more than a walk, no? Yeah, it's definitely a passion. So this is your, like, a small museum, no? Yeah, so this is our showroom floor, and mm -hmm. also we have our museum along through here of many old saddles, whether they were saddles that we had built or G.S. Garcia had built. This was my family's collection, my mom and my grandma's collection. So you have here 100 years of history? Most definitely, yeah. There's over 100 years of history there. Yeah, which slide do you prefer? Uh, all of them. <laughs> all of them. If I want to buy a horse, uh, I just have to ask you a saddle to order it. We can, we can build you a saddle, most definitely. But I don't have the horse. <laughs> we, can, we can always get you a horse. <laughs> you can send it to me. Yes. <laughs> The city lights up like a Christmas tree, and the casino hotels are showing no vacancy. The journey on this legendary train continues with its remarkable meetings on a 400 kilometer stage. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Welcome aboard. Sir. Thank you. I'll go through the Sierra Nevada, Reno, not Nevada's capital, but its main city, and stop in Truckee, which is already California. I can feel America mixing in the passenger cars. Incredible dreams are made here. Beautiful landscape, huh? Oh, yeah. It's like watching TV almost. You just get to watch <laughs> exactly. nature go right by. <laughs> so there's nobody. I don't know if you are still in Nevada or in California, but look, there's no villages around, no hamlets, no towns. I, I guess there there is no fence that says you're in California, you're in Nevada. There's no yeah. fence. I mean, it's just kind of one big country. People think of the states as little countries, yeah. but not so much. That's only when you're in the cities. When you're in the country, the country is its own state. Yeah, so we are in the middle of nowhere here. Middle of nowhere. So what are you doing? You are working in Nebraska or in Washington? I'm going moving to Washington and I'm going to be homesteading, living off the land, growing crops, hunting. Yeah. Um, my friend, he's been doing it for 14 years. Yeah. So not only will I be growing uh, organic food, my friend does goat yoga, which... Goat yoga? Yes. What, what is this? Well, he, he would so his goats breed and have baby goats. And then people pay him money for him to teach them yoga with the baby goats walking around. Original. Yeah. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah. People pay big money to do it. So this is a new life for you? I'm not scared, actually. It's a challenge, huh? No, I'm not scared. I'm, uh, it's, like, it's like one of those mountains. You just want to climb it, you know? You know it'll be hard, but it'll be worth it when you're on the top looking down at everything else. Yeah. Good luck huh, for your new life. I arrive in an ancient gold miners' village since become an affluent town. Bye -bye. And the California Zephyr has something to do with that. No snow on the way, huh? Oh, lots of snow. Hello. Hi. You are from here? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, the crane. Okay, oh, you, you are. 59, I never left. <laughs> you are a gold miner? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're still working. Oh, where's my gold? It's over in the jail. I had to lock it up, see? I lock it up, got all these safes. 
Because it's a jail here, yeah, not a jail. For who? For pretty undesirables. All right, okay. Small jail, actually, huh? It's linked with the history of the small village, Truckee. What happened here? Why do you have a, a jail? Well, let me tell you about this jail. This was 1875. This is right just soon after the railroad came to town. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of trains. There were up to 60 trains a day came through town. Okay. Imagine all the people that they're dropping off, all these undesirables. Right. Well, our county seat, the jail, is about 40 miles away in Nevada City. So this is really only a holding cell. We only have like one constable. So they decide, you know, we need to make another jail here to hold people. Sure. Which kind of people? So robbers or gangsters? Oh yeah, robbers and drunks and gangsters yes. and right. There's the train takes them all. Yeah. Okay. We so, see it was a Western way of life. Okay. Yes. So it was very right? dangerous. Actually, yes. Even it, truck, you know? Right. Back there in the late 1800s, it was it was wild times. Yeah. Right, a lot of guns going on, horses, drunks, right, drinking. It was, it was yeah. crazy. Thank <laughs> you for the visit, Greg. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello, Mark. Oh, hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, you too. You are the famous Thank historian you. of the city of Truckee. So Truckee was very involved in the development of the railroad in California and Nevada too. When Central Pacific Railroad decided this is the route for the world's first transcontinental railroad, mm -hmm. uh, and the first in the United States, of course, too, and it came right through this area, and that gave Truckee a reason to grow and become established and have its own economy. Mm -hmm. This had changed totally the economy of the western part of the USA. Absolutely. It opened up the door. If you think about it, before the railroad, if you got in your covered wagon pulled by oxen, Way back at the Mississippi River, 2,000 miles away, mm -hmm. it would take you five to six months to get to San Francisco, if you made it. Mm -hmm. When the railroad was completed, you could leave not just the Mississippi River, but New York City mm -hmm. and be in San Francisco in 10 days. In 10 days. And you could do it year round. It didn't matter if it was winter in the mountains. Mm -hmm. You get on the train, you have your luggage, you drink your wine, you eat your dinner, voila, we're in San Francisco. Fantastic. It's an amazing revolution. Okay, so maybe this is the spirit of trickery and the connection of railroads. So thank you, Mark, I was very happy to discuss with you. I just have to wait uh, the end of the snowstorm. If it's okay to go down to San Francisco. Good luck getting out of here. <laughs> Hello. This is a good coach. I just I want to go to San Francisco. It's here. Okay. I didn't expect this. California, snow, snow and more snow.
Emeryville is the last station. Next stop, the terminus, San Francisco. Everyone get off the train. Thanks. Finally, San Francisco, the end of the line. My iron horse can take a well-earned rest. It even seems to have been reincarnated as a cable car. California, the final frontier, where everything continues to be invented. In the land of the horse, even the Mustangs are on rails. Thank you. So, Van, uh, you are very familiar with the bay. Semi. Yes. <laughs> I, I worked on the bay, uh, 76 to 80 in the Coast Guard. Of right, course, go And ahead. my area was uh, Alcatraz, Angel Island, Sausalito, and out 50 miles. Uh, so you will show me, actually, the place on sure. Alcatraz Island and the bridge. That's where all the rich people keep their boats. <laughs> Swimmer, yeah, and he got bit by a seal. A seal, yes, I know. Well, well, the all... seals that don't beat, is I it? know. I know. And that guy, I guess he was uh, he was invading his territory, yes. You know? I okay. Yeah. So, here in San Francisco Bay, you can swim with the seals. Van tells me it can be dangerous because you can be bitten. Whatever the case, it's one of the most beautiful views of San Francisco. The vanishing horizon like an extension of the fabulous destiny of a legendary stagecoach called California Zephyr. So this is the Pacific Ocean, the last frontier, and it's here that my journey ends in San Francisco, a city of cultural diversity, an inventive city with its golden gate behind me, the one taken by Jack London long ago to write his books and heed the call of the wild. I love this crossing of the American West, from Colorado to California. And some very lovable characters, like Carly, Brandon, Tom, and the rest. Thank you for following me, and I'll see you soon.